later on, Kels. Yep. I guess we can start now, huh? <laughs> Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, the kids have been working really hard on this play that we're going to do for you today. So um, we hope you enjoy it. And I would like to say thank you all for coming and to the congregation and the church. Um, thank you for all of your support because none of this would have been possible without all of you. So sit back and enjoy and turn your listening ears on as the children present Just a Little Christmas. A long time ago, in a city of Nazareth, there was a woman named Mary. Mary was promised to marry a man named Joseph, who lived there too. One day, an angel from God came and talked to Mary. The angel told Mary she was going to have a baby. Mary, you are going to have a baby and he will be the son of God. Oh, okay. <laughs> Now Joseph wasn't sure what to do when he heard that Mary was going to have a baby. So one night while he was asleep, the angel came to talk to Joseph too. Joseph, Mary is going to have a baby. It's okay for you to marry her and take care of her and the baby. You will name the baby Jesus. Oh, okay. And, and so that's just what he did. A while later, the emperor in Rome, Caesar Augustus, said that everyone had to go to their own hometown to be counted. So Mary and Joseph went to the town of Bethlehem to be counted, because Joseph was of the house and line of David, and Bethlehem was known as the city of David. There were lots of other people there, too. There were so many people, in fact, that there was no room for them in the inn. So Mary and Joseph stayed in a stable, which was a place for animals to stay warm and dry. There was a cow there. <laughs> there was a sheep there. There was a donkey there. And Mary and Joseph stayed there too. While they were there, baby Jesus was born, and Mary took him and wrapped him up warm and laid him in the manger. shepherds out in the field watching over their flocks of sheep. And the angel came and talked to the shepherds and they were terribly afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid, I bring, you, I bring you good news. The Savior which is Christ the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem. You will find the baby wrapped in soft cloths and lying in a manger. And then the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then the angel left. And when the angel had left, the shepherds went and found the baby Jesus in the manger, just as they had been told. And when they found him, they worshipped him. Not far away, in a place called Jerusalem, there lived an evil king named Herod. One day, after baby Jesus had been born, wise men came to Jerusalem looking for the newly born king of the Jews. They asked King Herod where he was. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? So the king asked his advisors. Where is the king of the Jews to be born? In Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. Go and find him and let me worship him too. So the wise men went and found baby Jesus by following a star, and when they found him, they worshipped him. But King Herod didn't really want to worship baby Jesus. He wanted to harm him. And when the king found out he was tricked, he was really mad. Uh, I'm really mad. 
He was determined to destroy this newborn king, so King Herod sent his soldiers to Bethlehem to find the baby Jesus. Go and find him and destroy him. But God warned Joseph in a dream to get out of there. Get out of there. And so they did. And so Joseph and Mary and the little baby Jesus went to Egypt, and they stayed there until the evil King Herod died. <laughs> After King Herod died, God told Joseph it was safe to come back because the people who wanted the child dead had now died. Hey, you can come back now. It's safe. <laughs> Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus came back from Egypt, and they went to live in the town of Nazareth again. And that's where baby Jesus grew up until he was grown. And so now you've heard it all about how God sent his only son to be born as a baby so that later he could, ha he could save everyone from their sins. And all it took was just a little Christmas. Christmas. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. I want to thank the kids for doing that again. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I like the part where King Herod died. That was hilarious. Did, did anybody else want to boo and hiss when he came out? Is that, is that, am I the only one who grew up with melodramas? No, you guys did. You guys have melodramas here all the time, don't you? Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, Gary, is there a way to turn this light off right here? Unplug it? Oh, okay. Oh, it's not worth it. Don't worry about it. All right, we've got a little bit of time left today, and so I told, uh, I told the elders that I'd speak a little bit about Christmas after the kids are done with their program while they're changing clothes and stuff. Um, do you have that, um, those, yeah, the notes, thank you. Um, so we'll need the screen down again. Now, I talked with a youth group about this not too long ago, but they're all, not, they're all gone, so they don't have to hear it twice anyway. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Well, put, you can put that away for now. Put, put the, make it black for now. Sorry. I was making sure. Never mind. Okay. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Anybody? Okay, that, that's what we're celebrating, the birth of Christ. That's right. But why do we celebrate the birth of Christ? Because he's our Savior, right? Because eventually he dies on the cross, right? But why do we celebrate his birth? I had, what do you guys think? Because, yeah, that's right. They waited a long time for him, didn't they? You know, we celebrate birthdays, but the Jews don't celebrate birthdays the way we celebrate birthdays. And so when it comes time for Christmas, you know, why do we focus so much on celebrating the day that Jesus was born? We, we do celebrate the day that he died, that's Good Friday, and we celebrate the day that he rose from the dead, that's Easter, and those are actually the most important aspects of Jesus' life as far as eternity goes for us. But why do we celebrate his birth? Well, let me show you something interesting that God showed me, and some of you, it'll have a bigger impact. But before we get there, let me ask you this. What was Jesus? Was Jesus a man? Was he God? Okay, what percentage was he? Like 70, 30? 100% man and 0% God? 100% man and 100% God. He must be pretty big. <laughs> He's 200%. 
Now, we don't know how that works, but it's true. Jesus was a man, and he was also God, and this is important. In fact, wars were fought over that idea many, many centuries ago, back when Christianity was fairly uh, young. And his birth, the birth of Jesus, as God became man is a turning point in the history of the world. And we usually think of it as, like, like um, uh, Bill talked about, talked about today, we usually think of it as a uh, looking forward to the cross when we celebrate communion. But there's something about Jesus' birth that was good just for his birth, and I want to show you that today. Okay, show me the first thing on the screen. Okay. It's, there it is. What does that mean? It's a question. Oh, sorry, I, that, okay. There should be work in between your and yet. I told you I was tired today. <laughs> okay. No, I typed that. Let's just pretend that work was in there. <laughs> what would it mean? Huh? What does it mean? Okay, well, this, let's say that I, that I sent you this text message. What does it mean? Have you completed your project? Yeah, it could just be a straightforward question. What else might it imply? What's that? Well, that's well, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, but I'm talking about like if, like if you had a task to do and I sent you this text message, what might I be implying with that text message? Yeah, that maybe you're not done yet, or maybe you should have been done a long time ago, right? Those could be implied with that text message. Well, if you add all the words to it. That's what I could be implying. How do you know whether I'm just asking if you've got your task done or whether or not I'm implying that the task should have been done already? How do you know the difference in a text message? Yeah, do the next one. Okay, that one's there. All right, all of it's there. What does that mean? Let's say I sent that text to you. What does that mean? Yeah, that, may, that, 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 that you, you didn't tell me the truth, right? It could be implying that I thought you told me the truth, but you didn't. But what if I said it like this? <laughs> I thought you told me the truth. Now what am I saying? Yeah, that, that I was right. You're trying to trick me, but I was right. You did tell me the truth. You see how they're very different? Give me the last one. What does that mean? Any husbands ever gotten that text message while they're at work? It could be an emergency or not. <laughs> That's right. It could just be call me when you get a chance or it could be call me as soon as you can. You see, communication, when we want to talk to somebody and we send a text message, we, we put our life in our hands, really, because that those words can mean so many different things based on every other form of communication. For example, uh, they've done studies and found that words make up about a quarter of what we communicate. So if all you have are the words on your phone, then you're getting one-fourth of the message the person wanted to send you. The rest of that is in the look on your face, no, the sound in your voice, the way you're standing, the way you're moving towards or away from them, all of those things make up the rest of communication. Now, here's the point. You're like, why are we talking about communication and text messages on Christmas morning? Why did God send Jesus? So he could die on the cross. But what happened that morning? God, think about this. Actually, let me read to you a verse from Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Verses 1 and 2, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. But now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Imagine it like this. God's up in heaven. He calls the prophet and says, Ezekiel, I got a message for the people. Write this down and give it to the people. Uh, Jonah, I got a message for the people. Write this down. Send it to the people. Uh, Jeremiah, I got a message for the people. And the, the prophets would write the message down and hand the message to the people. Now, yes, sometime they did, you know, theatrics and stuff like that, but most of the time they were just handing them the text message. Israelites were only getting God's text messages for a thousand years, and God said, that's not enough. They're not getting the message because they were doing things all wrong. And when Jesus came to earth, he showed them, you guys have missed it because it was just written down in the law. 
They didn't have God face to face. See, here's the thing. You can't see God face to face, but you could see Jesus. You can't hear God's voice, generally speaking, but you could hear Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether something that happens is what God did or it's just circumstances, but you could see what Jesus did. And because God's communication to us is so, I was going to say holy, but that I meant full of holes anyway, uh, because it's missing so much because he's not right there in front of us like a human being where we can see everything, we miss part of his messages. And the Jews had missed a lot because they were, they were going through the motions of the law, but they had missed God's heart. God said, I want relationship with you. Don't just follow the law. Don't just do the sacrifices. Come and be with me. And they didn't catch it. So Jesus came to earth and said, okay, you can't miss it anymore. The only people that are going to miss it now are the ones who want to. And they did. And they missed it on purpose and are probably in hell right now. And Jesus told the whole world, if you believe in me, you'll have eternal life. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Excuse me. Uh, in the Amplified, it says he is the exact representation. Jesus was man and God simultaneously. So everything, in fact, let me show you something else too. John chapter 12, verse 50, it says, I know, Jesus is speaking, he says, I know that his commands, God's commands, lead to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Jesus didn't add to the text message. He didn't change the words. He said what God told him to say. What he changed was that he was there. He could say it to their face. So all of you people in the older generation that just really don't like email and really don't like text messages, I, I feel for you because they're not complete communication. You talk to teenagers like, why don't you send me a text message? Why do you have to call me? And the older generation is like, because you need to hear the tone of my voice, especially if you're dealing with a child. <laughs> you need to hear the tone of my voice so that you don't go, well, I didn't know you were upset. Yes, you did because I was talking to you. And God sent Jesus down to earth so that he could show people what God was really like. So what was God like? What did we learn? First one I thought of when I was writing this down is that Jesus loves kids. All these kids up here doing the show, Jesus just got the biggest kick out of that. He thought that was a He liked it better than we did. And I thought it was great because Jesus loves kids. You know God loves kids too? If Jesus loves kids, that means God loves kids. But you know what? The Jews didn't know that. They didn't know that God loved kids. Kids can't do anything. They can't accomplish anything. They can't make any money. They're just messy and break things and cause problems. So, <laughs> well, you're a little older now. So the Jews were like, you know, kids aren't really useful until they can actually get something done. But God loves them at, from conception. The Jews didn't know that until Jesus came down and showed them. We also saw that Jesus had compassion on stupid people. And remember, when I say stupid people, I don't mean people of lesser intelligence. I mean people that are doing things that don't work. People that are making stupid choices. Jesus had compassion on them. What about the woman that was caught in the act of adultery? That was stupid. And yet God had, or Jesus had compassion on him. Do you know the Jews didn't know God had compassion on stupid people? Did I say him? Her. The Jews didn't know God had compassion on stupid people because if you look in Leviticus, when you make a stupid choice, you get stoned to death. And so Jesus came down and showed the people God's heart. Also, Jesus had patience for proud people. A little bit. <laughs> he had patience for people that had pride. We get into arrogance in a second. The Jews didn't know that. We also found out that Jesus uh, had, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought that was wrong. Jesus had little patience for arrogant people, people who thought they were better than everybody else. Did you know that the Jews actually lauded proud people? If you thought higher of yourself than everybody else, other people thought higher of you too. It's kind of like junior high. <laughs> How do you be popular in junior high? Act popular. Apparently, I didn't know how to, so <laughs> it didn't work for me. The Jews thought God loved proud people. It wasn't until Jesus came along that they got it figured out. Jesus cared more about other people than himself, even though he was God. You know, a lot of people still today think that God is arrogant and selfish. Oh, God just wants us to worship him because he's some big prima donna. Well, he is the creator of the universe. 
So he's not Adana, but he is prima. He was first, okay? Prima Donna means the first lady, so it wasn't prima Donna, but he was first. But no, God isn't about himself. He's actually about everybody else. But the Jews didn't know that, and we didn't know that until Jesus came down and showed us God's heart. And also, this one's really powerful. This one struck me. God hurts for hurting people. You know, the Jews didn't have any real compassion for people who were hurting. God told them, you know, take care of widows and orphans, and they would do it, but they didn't really care. But then when Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb, and he's standing there, he knows exactly what's going to happen. Any second now, I'm going to raise this guy from the dead, and it's going to freak everybody out. I know Lazarus is not going to stay dead, and yet Jesus wept. Why? Because everybody else was hurting, and he hurt for them. When you are hurting, God hurts for you. He feels your pain. It hurts him. He has compassion for the hurting. The Jews didn't know that until Jesus came along and cried to the tomb and then raised the guy from the dead. I can imagine the disciples like, so what was going on back there? What was the problem? Didn't know it was going to work or something? What was the big deal? Because God hurts for hurting people. Jesus was born, probably not on the 25th of December, but he was born. We know that. And when he was born... He took a lot of the guesswork out of God. He showed us what God was like. If God were on earth today, what do you think he would do? Well, he would kill all them liberals and he would destroy the Russian or the USSR. And, you know, that was a little outdated. But, you know, he, he would fight for our political rights as Christians. No, I'll tell you what Jesus would probably do. He'd probably go out to the hurting and the needy and the broken, and the lost. He'd preach the good news of the kingdom. He'd heal diseases. He'd drive out demons because that's what God wants to do. And when he became a man, that's what he did. He didn't change when he became Jesus. Jesus is God. And so when God is up in heaven and you're praying, you say, I don't know what to pray. You know what to pray. Pray what Jesus did. Right now, I'm actually feeling better in my body than I have for the last 12 hours. I believe it's adrenaline partially, but I also believe that my prayer is being answered because God loves to heal people. If he didn't love to heal people, why did Jesus spend so much time doing that? It's God's heart. Now, Jesus did die on the cross. We celebrate that in communion. He shed his blood for our sins, but that was a means to an end. He died so that you could have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Now, you don't even need to see Jesus face to face. Jesus says, I'm going to go. It's better for you that I go back to the Father because if I go, I'll send the Holy Spirit. Why was the Holy Spirit better than face to face with God? Because now God's in there. You don't even have to see him now. He'll tell you what he's thinking through the Spirit. He'll reveal his heart to you through the Spirit. He will show you what he's feeling, what he wants through the Spirit, because that's, that's why Jesus died and rose from the dead, so that you could have God living inside of you. So as you celebrate Christmas this year, which is just a couple days away, I want to encourage you. Celebrate his birthday. Give gifts to each other. Enjoy the time with family. It's a fantastic holiday, okay? But don't forget, Jesus came so that you could see what God was really like so that you didn't have to put up with just getting text messages from God. You could have a face-to-face -face communication with him. And as you read your Bible, don't let it just be the text on the page. Let the Spirit speak to you as you read, because that's why he's there. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending yourself in the form of your Son, that he might show us what you're really like. And God, what an image he gave us. You are so compassionate, and merciful, and patient, and kind, and generous, and it's just, you just can't summarize it, Lord. You're so good in everything that you do, and Jesus was so good in everything that he did. Thank you for showing us that, that we could trust you, and so that he could die on the cross, so that we could know without a shadow of a doubt that you love us. Thank you, Lord. This Christmas season, remind us that we could celebrate Jesus as you come down to us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.